Hello everyone, Grub here. This will be a continuation slash companion of my video I did on all the mechs in Mech Assault, particularly targeted at people who are coming to Mech Assault from Mech Warrior. This will focus on the differences between Mech Assault and Mech Warrior and all the things you need to know if you're coming into this game from Mech Warrior Online, from the previous Mech Warrior game etc. Mech Assault, it may look like just a simple arcade shooter, and it is, but most of the people that have played it will agree that it is sort of its own thing. Just because it's simple, it isn't bad. The best analogy I can think of is the original Halo, where it seems simple on the surface, but the mechanics allow for deeper gameplay than what it looks. So I will be covering just the basics here, this will be a quick video, but we'll get you introduced to the world of Mech Assault compared to Battletech. Now for this video, I will be focusing on Mech Assault 1, the original, released in 2002. Mech Assault 2, a lot of the concepts are the same, but Mech Assault 2 plays very differently than Mech Assault 1 does as far as team and gameplay aspects. So I may do another video at some point detailing the differences between Mech Assault 1 and Mech Assault 2, but just be aware that this video will primarily be focusing on Mech Assault 1. Starting with the most basic elements, the movement and controls. The movement is third-person shooter movement and aim. You don't have to worry about the speed and direction of your legs in relation to your torso like you do in Mech Warrior. Your torso is completely independent from your legs, so you can twist all the way to 360 degrees and beyond, and you don't have to worry about that. There is a tiny bit of inertia in that you will start moving faster after you're moving for about a second, but you don't have that sort of energy management that you do with having to worry about what direction your legs are and having to worry about the time that it will take to speed up and slow down like you do in the other games. So torso twisting and the direction you're facing is a lot less of an issue in this game. It's even less of an issue because of the way the health system works. There are no components in this game. There's no center torso, left torso, right torso, limb. All damage on the mech is totalized in one health bar. Just as a note onto that, it is possible to get crippled and knocked over in this game. Although that happens by random chance, and it's more dependent on the weapon type that's used instead of where you're hit. So you can get hit in the torso or in the legs, and you can still get knocked over. It does not matter. In that same note, in the same vein, you can get limbs blown off in single player on the AI mechs, but player-driven mechs will never get their limbs blown off. So damage in this game is much more nebulous than it is, and it doesn't matter where you hit or where you get hit, so torso twisting is even less important. Final notes on mech health and damage. When a mech gets very, very close to death, sometimes the glow from the reactor will show through the armor plates. This doesn't always happen, and it's a lot more obvious on some mechs than it is on others, but it serves as a visual indication that the mech is very, very close to exploding. On the explosions themselves, they are way more powerful than any other Battletech entry. You really need to stay a safe distance away when they blow up, or else you will blow up yourself. I will say it leads to some very cool clips and very satisfying chain reactions, though. Actually, all I know is I looked over and I saw an Atlas-like mech. It's all I know. Yeah, I understand, I understand. I'm not... I'm not giving you shit for understanding. But I will. Cause I'm an oh. asshole. What the hell? Uh, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Holy shit. Scrub, can you not eliminate the entirety of the server? That was literally just dominoes right there. Oh my god. You just board wiped the entire map. Heat management is different in this game. All weapons generate heat, even ballistic ones, and firing your jump jets will also generate a small amount of heat, 
But the trade-off is that you won't shut down and become vulnerable when you overheat. You can still run at full speed. You can still jump jet. You just can't fire your weapons while the, the heat is in the red part of the bar. The mechanic where you cool off faster if you stand in the water is implemented in this game. But the mechanic where your mech is hotter if the environment is hotter is not. At least not noticeably. Let's talk briefly about the mech chassis and mech variations in this game. Now, there's no mech lab or mech customization, and while there is a fair number of chassis, it's not nothing compared to the rest of Battletech. So what they've done instead is they made a derivative variant of each chassis, which is based on another mech from the series. For example, there is no Bowman in this game, but there is a catapult variant named the Bowman, which has the Bowman's weapon set. Same thing with the Madcap Mark II. There's no Madcap Mark II in this game, formally, but there is the Timberwolf variation of the Madcat, which has a loadout that's based on that. I'll probably put a graphic up to show these relations, but this is mostly to clear up the confusion over chassis that are named different things than they usually are, or mechs that are using both their clan and inner sphere names in the same game. This is why. If you're still confused, just go over to my video where I go over every mech in the game and discuss their weapon loadouts and roles. It's a lot simpler. On to the meat and potatoes of mech combat, the weapons. The Weapons in this game are familiar, but they are balanced a little bit differently than they are in the rest of Mech Warrior. All weapons have unlimited ammo per se. You will never be in a situation where you cannot fire a particular weapon, even a ballistic weapon or a missile weapon. However, you can pick up salvage upgrades, which give you a, a boost in a weapon's power. For a limited number of shots. These can go from level 1, which is the base, to level 2 and level 3 upgrades, respectively. The salvage spawns procedurally on the map, and it drops from enemies when they die. The salvage has the same color coding that the weapons do. They have blue for energy-based weapons, yellow for ballistics, and red for missiles. Just bringing it up here, fourth salvage type is health, which is green, and does what you would think it does. This weapon upgrade system also replaces the weapon sub-variants in this game. So an autocannon is just an autocannon, and it's the same whether it's mounted on an atlas or on a cougar. There's no... ER, PPC, it is all the same. The custom weapon groupings and fire groups have been simplified in this game to where each mech has just one type of weapon from each category. Some mechs only have two, but most mechs have one of each of energy, missile, and ballistic. As for the weapons themselves, there are three weapons in each category, basically going from least effective to most effective, and two special weapons. Some of these weapons are familiar, some of them act very differently. I will be describing them each in turn. Starting with energy, the lasers in this game are projectile based. In fact, every weapon in this game is projectile based. They come in two varieties, the pulse laser, which acts like a Star Wars blast and the regular laser, which basically is a slow pulse laser. The PPC is the most dramatically different weapon in this entire game. Remember that ballistic weapons generate heat now, and they have unlimited ammo, so the traditional PPC would just be another Gauss rifle. So in this game, what they've done is they've turned it into basically a slow but heavy-hitting missile. You charge it up, and it flies relatively slowly, but with a very high damage and very high heat generation. 
the ballistic weapons behave pretty much as you would expect them to, with the exception of the aforementioned traits of generating heat yet having unlimited ammo. Other than that, they behave pretty much as you would expect a machine gun, auto cannon, and Gauss cannon to behave. The missiles in this game generally have fewer missiles per volley than their mech warrior counterparts, but it evens out because they do more damage per individual missile. The LRMs and SRMs are named different things, but it, you can just keep calling them SRMs and LRMs because everyone pretty much does. The lock-on in this game is instantaneous. There's no audio tone to go with it, but as long as your reticle is in the general vicinity and as long as they aren't using any defensive measures, you'll see the red crosshair circling the target, and if you fire at that point, it will track towards the enemy. There is also no minimum range for missiles, or any weapon, in this game. There's no real direct analog for the Warhammers. They somewhat resemble the Thunderbolt missiles, but kind of different. When you pull the trigger, it starts the little clock in the reticle spinning around. That's your time delay fuse. And when you release the trigger, it will launch the missile with that time delay. They're very slow, and they carry momentum from your mech, so they're hard to aim. But they have a huge blast radius, and they actually, due to glitches in the game's programming, they can actually stack even more damage on top of that. It's pretty much agreed that they are the most powerful weapon in Mech Assault. Lastly, we have sort of specialty weapons. The Flamer in this game is pretty much useless. It's only on the Hellbringer, and it doesn't have the same effect that it does in Mech Warrior, where it overheats the enemies. In this game, it's so weak, it's basically non viable. Then you have the Lava Gun, which is the opposite end of the spectrum. The Lava Gun is a little trickier to use than Warhammers, but it is always upgraded all the time, so you don't need to search for salvage for it. It's very powerful on its own in close quarters. Not necessarily as long range, but definitely in close quarters. Lastly in the mech's arsenal are the defense abilities. Not every mech has one, but most mechs do. They are rechargeable abilities mostly designed to boost your survivability. The AMS in this game is flare-type AMS. Rather simple, but it's important to note in this game that it only protects you. It won't draw missiles away from an ally right next to you. It is only drawing the target away from you. Null Sig turns your mech invisible for a short time. Like Halo Active Camo, it won't cloak all the way if you're moving at top speed or if you fire your weapons. It's also limited in that it does not cover up footprints, dust, or water kicked up from your feet, so an observant player can still notice you. The Target Jammer is probably the most powerful ability in this game. It not only stops weapons like missiles and PPCs from locking onto you, but it also disables the predictive shot and bullet magnetism that is even used by ballistic weapons. So no matter what weapon you're using, it's actually very hard to hit somebody if they're using target jammer, especially at long range. Lastly, the shield. Like the lava gun, it is only on the Ragnarok and Ymir. It provides a second of invincibility. A fleeting second, but then it recharges very quickly. So this is basically a manual anti-missile slash anti-PPC system. <sighs> Lastly, some notes that just don't fit into any other category. Mechs cannot climb up slopes nearly as well as they can in some of the other Mech Warrior entries. Jump jets are a lot more important, although there is ways around that. You will learn that in time. There's a lot of destructible environments in this game, and they can be destroyed comparatively very easily. This makes them a legitimate strategy on some maps, such as denying the enemy team cover on River City, or shooting the rock ledges to collapse them onto the enemy team on Rock Solid. 
generally keep an eye out for destructible environments and hazards relating to that. The mech classes and roles were not as well balanced in this game, admittedly, as other mech warrior titles. Because the meta would get rather stagnant if we just went with what was most powerful, we use a sort of pseudo tier list system. The most commonly used is the one done by Big Talk, where we break the mechs up into different classes based on their power level and usage compared to each other. I'll refer you to his video on the subject, but just so you know what it means when we're referring to doing an OU match or an RU match or something like that. It's sort of a tier list type system. This last topic is... A little long to cover in this short video, but it's a point of thought to team composition. Like any mech game, you have to balance your team with the strengths of the different mechs and the environments that you're playing in. But this game actually has an extra dimension to that in that you have to think about salvage. Because each mech drops a certain number and type of salvage, you have to think about how those different mechs, what they drop and what they use. This is something that you'll just get introduced to over time, but it's, again, a point of thought because in some cases it may be more advantageous to take a weaker mech because it can either take advantage of salvage from another mech or drop salvage for another mech. You can, of course, pick up salvage from enemies and on the map, but it can be more advantageous if your team salvage loadout plays well together. And closing up this video, if you've watched this far, clearly you are interested in this game. We run a fan community and a fan discord where we play fairly regularly. You can get this game set up to play online for free without even needing the original hardware. Check out the Mech Assault Reborn discord linked in the description. There you can get instructions on how to set it up, and if you want updates on when we will be playing. Usually the formal game nights are once every other week, and the informal game nights are once to twice a week. Hopefully I will see you there. Till then, thank you for watching.